the period of time that we had. Um, so, thank you for, are we on, 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 like, live, like, we're actually on, on? Actually, we'll push that. Oh, no, 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 no. I just want to make sure I was on live. Uh, welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study here at Expedition Church. Uh, we are continuing in our book, Healing. I mean, uh, not healing, but the Bible in the light of our redemption by E.W. Kenyon. Uh, that's what we're studying from. And we ask you to share our service with other people and tune in and be a part of the service. Glory to God. So happy to have you. And uh, hey, Dusty, what's up, buddy? And um, praise the Lord. All right. So let's, um, let's jump in here. Last week we did start on healing. Didn't finish, but we started on it. Um, and we talked about how that healing is, um, is controversial in the body of Christ. N not because uh, we're controversial about it, it's because there's people who don't believe that it's still available today. And uh, this is, you know, as we talked about last week, that's an erroneous position. And uh, we did cover, I can't recover that again. Um, <clears throat> but we did talk about that. And um, we talked about um, the, the, those three attitudes of concerning healing in the, that are prevalent in the church today. Uh, one is that um, miracles have passed away. <laughs> That's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's just stupid. All of a sudden, God, God just stopped being supernatural and really powerful because we have a written Bible. I believe in the written word. I believe it supersedes uh, the gifts of the Spirit, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't mean he doesn't do those things anymore. Um, some people say it's only a special, uh, special faith or a special prayer that people can get healed, and, and otherwise they can't. And then the third group um, just believes. Um, let me see. What was that third one? I'm trying to uh, first. And then the third one is. That, God, that people teach that it is a part of redemption. It belongs to the believer, which is what, that's our camp. That's us. We believe it's part of the believer. So we talked, we went on and said, you know, where does sickness come from? Where does sickness in the Bible and disease in the Bible come from? And um, we talked about how the fact, um, we did cover that last week, right? Okay. Uh, that uh, sickness is the evil offspring of its father, sin. Now, it does not mean that if you are sick, you did some major thing wrong last week. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the fall of man, the high treason of Adam in the garden, uh, opened the door, number one, to spiritual death, which also opened the door to physical sickness and, and financial poverty. Okay? They all came as a result of the fall. They were not part of God's original plan, okay? And so, you know, I mean, and some people take that passage where Jesus, uh, you know, with the disciples, there was a man born blind, and um, the disciples said, Master, wh who sinned, his mother or him, that he should be born this way? He said, neither. Now, remember, the Greek doesn't have punctuation in it. You've got to read contextually in order to get punctuations for English. And... Um, he went on and said that the works of God must be work, uh, must work while it's still light. Now, a lot of people say to God, oh, see, God made him sick so he could heal him. And I, I always come back, okay, but he got healed. The works of the one that sent him was he got healed. And then really what it was, he, Jesus dealt with the question, who did sin this man or his parents? And he said, neither. But I must work the works of him that sent me while it's still light. And he healed him. So the works of the one that sent him was the healing. Okay? So if, you're, if you were made blind, because God had a purpose, the purpose is to heal you. I don't even believe that. Okay? But if you're going to take that narrative, you can't leave it in you stay blind, because that's, that's not what happened there. If you use that as your example, you've got to follow the whole, the whole uh, typology or allegory of that. I'm going to go ahead and say it. We had it. There was a discussion here after, after church about allegories, etc. Bible 
interpretation rule number one. You take it literally. Bible rule interpretation number two. If it cannot be taken literally, then it may either be allegorical or typology. You do not create an allegory for everything in the Bible and it becomes the hard, fast rule. Per se, trees in the Bible mean this. And everything about doing trees means this. That You can't do that. I said you cannot do that. All right? Um, I was told that the trees in the garden that they could eat of were angels I felt like Jack Sparrow I say mate <laughs> that was really and, and you know when then you know the fig tree and the, and the thing was this and the pre, leaves were the priest and the uh, figs were people and you know, trees are always represent this throughout the Bible. No, they don't. You know, most of the time in the Bible, a tree is just a tree. And I, I found it very interesting that there's only one place in the entire New Testament that something is referred to as an allegory, and Paul tells us what it is. That's Mount Sinai. It's referred to, and it's, these are an allegory, one cup, referring to the covenants. And he tells us what it is. We don't have to go around and go, this is an allegory. And then you're going to go take that through the whole Bible. Watch out for that stuff. That, that gets you over into weirdness. It'll get you into weirdness every day of the week. You stay with literal first. If it can't, like, uh, all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. That's obviously a typology or an allegory. It is not literal because trees don't have hands. Okay? And it was just, it was symbolic of something. It didn't really, but it doesn't mean that, you know, that now the trees in the Garden of Eden are angels that clap their hands. Back to my little sermon for the night. I'm just... Told the person that I didn't see it that way. They went right outside, got some church member outside, and started telling them. I'm like, back to the origin of sickness and disease. <laughs> it's from the devil. All right? That was free. Pastors have to deal with stuff that, that traveling ministers don't have to deal with. <laughs> okay? Um, so, God looks at disease the same way he looks at sin. And we know that because he used the same sacrifice to deal with both. Isaiah 53, who self for our sins, I mean, Isaiah 53 is um, quoted and referred to in 1 Peter 2.24, 1 Peter 2.24, who is all self for our sins in his own body on the tree, the cross, that we being dead to sin shall live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Now, we know from uh, Matthew, uh, Isaiah 53, um, 3, 4, 5, 6, that, that middle, pa that passage there, and Matthew 8, 16, and 17, that by the strengths we were healed is referring to physical sicknesses and ailments. It's not the spiritual sickness of sin. It, they, those, those passages make it clear it's talking about physical. Okay? So Jesus bore our sin, but he also bore our sickness. Okay? He bore our sin to take it away from us. He bore our sickness to take it away from us. Exodus 15, 36, 26, through 36, that passage there at the end, God is referred to as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord thy physician, or the Lord that healeth thee. And then the Lord, the Bible says, and makes very clear, I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus is declared in the book of Acts, chapter 10, this, I mean, in the book of Hebrews, I'm sorry, in Hebrews, that Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He didn't change. He's the same. Say he's the same. All right. So God's, uh, God um, had a purpose. He is Jehovah Rapha. He's the Lord that healeth thee. Jesus came 
as a direct and express representation of the will of the Father. Now, if you want to know what the Father is like, look at Jesus. How do you know that? Because Je Philip, remember Philip came to him and said, Master, show us the Father and that will be sufficient for us. And Jesus says, have I been with you so long, Philip, and you don't understand it yet? That he that has seen me has seen the Father. I came not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. And then Jesus said this, I only do those things that I see my Father do. So Jesus made it very clear, everybody said very clear, that whatever he did was a representation of the will of the Father. Now I challenge you, and I can challenge you with great confidence, okay? Go through the ministry of Jesus and find some place that he put cancer, some kind of disease, uh, back in that day, uh, the, the most dreaded disease would have been leprosy on someone and put it on them and said, I'm doing this to teach you a lesson. Find it. Go ahead. I challenge you. I'll wait. And I say it with great confidence because you can't find it because it ain't there. So if he's the will of the Father, if he's the representation of the will of the Father, and you can't find him making people sick, then guess what the will of the Father is not? Making people sick. But we've all been taught to say, well, the, I, the Lord knows what he's doing. I don't know why he did it, but he has a reason for it. Well, well, well stop. Why didn't Jesus do it? Because he only did the things he saw the Father do. And he can't find anywhere where the Jesus did that. Now, come back on the other side. Find one place where he refused to heal somebody. I challenge you there. The closest you're going to come, okay? The closest you'll come is the woman whose daughter was grievously vexed with the devil. That's as close as you'll get. And she got delivered. She cried after the disciples tried to shut her up. And he said, you know, bring her here. He said, what, will you, what do you want? She says, Master, I want, you know, I want my daughter. She's vexed with the devil. And he looked at her and said, it's not meat to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. Why? She wasn't a Jew. Now, what he meant was, you don't, have a, you, don't, you don't have access to the covenant. You're not in covenant. You don't have a covenant right. See, under the old covenant, they had a right to be healed. Well, God said, God had declared himself. Now, Dr. Schofield, in his Bible, in, in um, discussing um, the Je name Jehovah, or as we say, the, the four-letter word Y-H-W-H, and I forget, there's, there's a term for it, some kind of gram. I, and I'm, I'm going to have to look it up so I know I can be more astute. It's some type of gram. It, it, it's something gram. Those four letters, because they have no consonants, and so it's referred to as some kind of gram, uh, because there were no consonants in it, and the Jews forgot how to pronounce it. A tetragrammaton. A tetragrammaton. Okay? I, I almost got it straight. A tetragrammaton. Okay? It means no consonant, no vowels, just consonants, and they didn't, they forgot how to pronounce the name. Okay? But it is the word we translate either Yahweh or Jehovah, and it's simply the, the people in whatever camp decide what vowels to use and how to construct it. Jehovah was done by dramatic, dramatic translators. Okay? So the Y was changed to a J because there's no J in Hebrew. They changed it to a J. Put the E, the O, and the A in there. And, and the, the Y, the W became a V because of the dramatic, the V in, in German, V is a W and W is a V. So that's how we got Jehovah. The other group more, wanted to be more literal and they put uh, an A and an E in there and made it Yahweh. Okay? 
same tetra gram grammaton. Same tetragrammaton. One is Yahweh, one is Jehovah. But it, going back, it's the same YHWH. All right? Now, we see in our Bibles as all what they call small caps. So it's, it's a different font, and it's, you know, when you see the word Lord, and it's all capital letters, but they're in what they call small caps. That is that tetragrammaton. Hey! Three times in a row. Say it real quick. Tetra, tetragrammaton. 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 Okay. And they put it there so you will know that it is that word. Now, that word, the translator Jehovah or Yahweh, so and, and I'm, I'm, I'm more used to saying Jehovah, so I'm, that's probably what I'm going to say most of the time. Schofield in his Bible says that Jehovah is the distinct covenant name of God. So it's a covenant name. I am the Lord thy God. I'm the Lord that keepeth covenant. So when he said, I am Jehovah, he was declaring, I'm in covenant with you. And then he said this, and he said, the compound forms of Jehovah are given increasing self-revelation of his covenant with his covenant people. Jehovah to Sidkenu, the Lord your righteousness. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord your victor or captain. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord your provider. Amen? Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is present with you. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is your peace. It's an increasing self-revelation. Now, of the seven compound covenant names that God gave uh, uh, to Jehovah when, in naming himself to the people, guess which one was first? After Jehovah, the first compound form of Jehovah was found in Exodus, Jehovah Rapha. I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord thy physician. Now, I find that interesting for God to take the time to make sure that the very first name, that comp the compound name with his covenant name was healing. Especially in light of the day that so much of the church doesn't believe that God heals. Now remember, I am the Lord, Jehovah, and I change not. Now just because we got a new and a better covenant established by better promises, doesn't mean he stopped being Jehovah Rapha. He did not cease to be your healer. He did not cease to be your peace. He did not cease to be your victory. He did not cease to be there. Now, if he's no longer Jehovah Rapha, he's no longer present. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Are you here? See, we get people who go, uh, well, he don't heal anymore. Well, then he ain't there no more. Because in that same Jehovah gave the name Jehovah Rapha, also gave Jehovah Shama. The Lord is present. The Lord is there. And you no longer have any victory. Why? Because he's Jehovah Nisi, the, the Lord's your victory. Oh, no, he's, he's, and you ain't got no peace. He's Jehovah Shalom. You can't get rid of one without getting rid of all of them. Hello. It doesn't work that way. It, well, cause it, just because it doesn't fit your theological narrative doesn't mean that it's so. See, we have to let our narratives be formed by the Bible. And when we don't line up with it, it has to change us. We don't change it. It changes us. Okay, so somebody you knew died. Yeah. And they were sick. Yeah. And I've also known people go to hell. Hello? Well, well, well. That's a pretty deep subject. Amen? Jesus came into the earth and began doing things. 
And let's face it, folks, you could be healed under the old covenant. Healing was available. They had a covenant right to it. They had a covenant right and access to Jehovah Rapha. But the priest didn't practice it. So Jesus comes along, and he upset the priest because he's doing in his works the things that they had denied the people, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness. Now remember, the ministry of Jesus is not a new covenant ministry. He did it under the law. So healing was available under the old covenant. Now, it's transitioning to the new, but it's an old covenant ministry. I've come not, remember, I've come but for the house, the, the sheep, the, the uh, lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, it went to the Gentiles after the resurrection, but his ministry was to the, house, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It was an old covenant ministry. Showing what God had even provided under the old covenant. Healing and miracles was available to the people. And when the, you know, the ten got healed of leprosy, <coughs> he said, go show yourself to the priest and offer the, what Moses commanded. One came back and worshipped him. He said, where are the other nine? And they said, they, I don't know. He said, well, your faith has made you whole. Got, it's like that country song. Got his nose back, got his fingers back, got his first two toes back. You ever heard the song, what, what happens when you play a country song backwards? Get your two dogs back, get your first wife back. <laughs> it's a song. <laughs> well, uh, he got made whole. He got all the body parts restored. Those just got healed. They were cleansed of their leprosy. He got it all back. He was he made whole. Glory to God. And so he began to teach on faith, which was going to be the way to receive under the new covenant instead of going to the priest to receive from the priest. You were going to go by faith to the Father and receive. And so he's beginning to teach the method and the message of the new covenant, but his ministry operated under the old. Are y'all here? Y'all gone home? All righty. He even said to the centurion, I have not found so great a faith, not, not even all of Israel. Meaning Israel could have had the faith that could receive the things they needed from God. Now I'll give you another point. Well, let's get in here. That's in here. Let me, let me go ahead. Um, Jesus had a ministry of delivering and healing. Now, Brother Hagee used to teach a sermon. I've never heard him teach it. But I I've used, took the title and I preached it. Uh, salva uh, salvation and healing, God's double cure. Forgiveness and healing, God's double cure. Because God will forgive you spiritually and God will heal you physically. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Um, throughout the ministry of Jesus, he would deliver people who were oppressed of Satan. It included healing for the physical body. Remember John 10, 10? The thief cometh not but for two. Steal, kill, and destroy. I have come, what's this? When Jesus switched and said, and I have come, he's given the antithesis to his previous statement. His previous statement is a thesis. Satan steals, Satan kills, and Satan destroys. The antithesis is, I have come that them I have life and have it to the full or have it more abundantly. In other words, I didn't come to steal, I didn't come to kill, or I didn't come to destroy. I came to bring life. John G. Lake referred to um, when he was dealing with the bubonic plague in Africa. And um, the, you know, the British frigate came in, medical frigate came in. And he went ahead and got there dealing with all these dead people and, you know, burying them and, and ministering to the people who were still alive. And um, they said, Dr. Lake, no, 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 you can't, you can't touch these people. They're, they're, they're highly infectious even after they die. And, um, yeah, I know you've heard this before, but it always fits here. He said, gentlemen, he said, if you, got, you got your microscopes there. He said, uh, go get me a slide. And, so they, you know, and when they died, this, this foam would just come out. They would, they, they, this froth would come up out of their lungs. It was, just a, it was a horrible death. And he took some of the froth and put it on a slide. He said, go look at that. They put, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. That's, 
oh, that's, that's bubonic plague. Oh, it's, oh, yeah. He said, all right, watch this. He took his hand, wiped some foot on something. Now look at that. It's dying right before our eyes. He said, that, sirs, is the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus overcoming the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Glory to God. He said, he basically, I'm immune to it. Because there's a, law, there's a greater law working in me. Hallelujah. And so we have to, we have to be, you know, believe God and trust God and know God and know, know our place in God. But also understand that Jesus is the healer, not the sickness put on her. I don't know if there's a better way to say that or not. If y'all can come up with a better way to articulate that, let me know. Okay? Jesus delivered physical bodies. Amen? Everywhere he went, he was working against the work, works of Satan. The Bible says in, the, in, in um, I forgot what the book is saying right now. For this purpose was the Son of God manifest to destroy the works of of the devil and Jesus went round about their villages teaching in their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and disease among the people when he healed the blind man that was born blind after you know they tried to figure out if, who was who did the sin he didn't even want to deal with that that wasn't a big deal God's merciful he said I must work the works of him that sent me by this light and healed him so if Jesus is healing, hello, Satan steals, kills, and destroys, and the purpose he was sent was to destroy the works of the earth. And the French Bible, I believe it, translated from French back into English says to reduce to zero the works of the devil. I believe it's the French Bible. So if you take the French Bible, that passage, and translate it back into English to reduce to zero. I like that. Because what's zero? Neil. Net. Name? <laughs> Hello. There's, if you got zero, you got nothing. If you get a bank account letter this week and it has zero down there on your total balance, you got nothing. Okay? And Jesus came to bring Satan's power, his works, to zero. Amen. And he steals, kills, and destroys. So we know from Scripture that Satan is the oppressor. Satan is the author of sickness and disease. Jesus is the healer. And it's the will of the Father to heal because he only did what he saw the Father do. Amen. They, people, listen, people. People got so adamant and so anti-healing. They started saying that people who laid hands on the sick were of the devil. Christians. That's up there. They're of the devil. In the name of Jesus, be made whole and they get healed. They're of the oh, give me a break. <clears throat> that is holding on to your narrative no matter what. Hello? Actually, it's more than that. It's being stupid. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Let's look at Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Aren't y'all glad y'all could be here tonight? We're not, on, we're not doing this on, the, on Zoom. I'm so happy. I'm just enjoying this. Luke chapter 13, verse, um, not, not Luke chapter 10, but Luke chapter 13, Eddie. Glory to God. And verse uh, 10, Luke 13, 10 is where we're going to start. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath day. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity. See, you can also be infirmity. You can have a spirit. Why? Because Satan's evil. He'll not only make people sick physically, he'll put spirits on them to enforce a disease. 
Not all, listen, not every sickness is a spirit, but there are diseases that are spirits that have to be dealt with as such. A spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bound together and could in no wise lift herself up. Now, have you ever seen anybody that was, you know, bowed over? You know, a lot of women had get osteoporosis there. Thank you. I can, I can get a tetra uh, grammaton, but <laughs> osteoporosis I'm struggling with. And Jesus saw her. He called it unto, unto him. Uh, he, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. He laid hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Stop. Who did she glorify when she was healed? Amen. And the ruler of the synagogue answered, We got some of these folk today. <clears throat> with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, see, they'll get up and start working against what God did because it messes with their narrative. <coughs> amen. Well, not amen. Lord, help us. There are six days in which men ought to work. In them, therefore, come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. You jerk. I'm sorry. You jerk. Here's a woman for 18 years been showing up in your synagogue, and you ain't done doodly squat for her. Jesus walks in, looks at her, has compassion on her, calls her up, lays hands on her, sets her free, and she's out glorifying God, and he's ticked off because he healed on the Sabbath. <clears throat> what could be more in the heart of God than ministering his life to his people on his holy day? But no. They healed on the Sabbath. They're a cult. He needs to be taken out back and whooped. Just be honest with me. And the Lord answered and said unto him, now this is King Jimmy for being ticked off. Thou hypocrite. I, I just, I've just got to imagine, Jesus was like, thou hypocrite. You know, you've seen the, the um, pictures of Jesus, you know, the, the, Euro, the European pictures of Jesus. He's so gentle, meek and lowly, thou hypocrite. You hypocrite! I don't believe, I don't believe it was this wimpy Jesus. That was a carpenter. Are you here? Before power tools. And he did not go and it get all cut up and become something. Didn't make a little clay pigeons and touch them, they flew off. Which is what one, one cult says. Do not each one of you on the Sabbath day lose, loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? <coughs> now, wait a second. You'll go get your ox or your donkey out and take them over and get them water on the Sabbath day. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. They need water. And oh, not this woman. Listen to this next phrase. And you need to underline this next phrase. Being a daughter of Abraham. What does that mean? She's in covenant. She's under the Abrahamic covenant. She has a covenant right to Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healeth thee. It is her covenant, Jehovah Rapha, right to be healed. You're willing to take your donkey or your, your ox over and get him some water on the Sabbath, but a woman who has a covenant right better not come on the Sabbath to get healed. And listen to what he says. 
Oh, now this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound. Who say who bound her? Not God. Not God. He's saying she's a covenant woman and Satan has bound her for 18 years. What? Be loose from this bond on the Sabbath. And when they heard these things, his adversaries were ashamed. And all, that's right, they should have been. And all the people rejoiced for the glorious things that were done by him. So here we have Jesus teaching by this very event that the covenant people have a right to Jehovah Rapha. Satan is the oppressor. Look at Acts 10, 38. And see, people will read their Bibles and stop listening to uh, theologians. Well, Pastor, you're a theologian. I, I, I get it. But I want to point you to the Bible. I don't want you to go out of here and go, well, I believe such and such. Why? Because Pastor Ed said it. Oh, wrong. <laughs> I want you to be a Berean. You're called to be a Berean. What's that? They went into Berea. And they were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily to see whether those things be so or not. The Assemblies of God have a Bible school called Berean, the Berean Bible School, Berean Bible College. Because I, as a pastor, I teach, I share the Word of God, I share these things, but you have to go to the Bible and believe it because it's in the Word of God. Not because I said it. Me saying it ain't good enough. Hello? I said, me saying it ain't good enough. Ain't, you, ain't not a real word. Pardon me. Me making the declaration is not sufficient enough for you to believe. You must find it in the word for yourself. In other words, me saying it ain't good enough. <laughs> okay? So I can say it right. It just didn't have as much effect. You know, proper English sometimes lose it. You know, lose. Some stuff just don't preach real good. All right? Now, um, Acts 10, 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, him that, he that feareth him, and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism of John. I'm sorry, the baptism that John preached. Here's, here's the message, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all, listen to this, <coughs> all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Now the writer Luke says that the message is that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with power, who went about doing good and healing. Well, who? All that were oppressed of the devil. Who's the oppressor? The devil, folks. We see it over and over and over again in Scripture, yet we'll come into churches and people say, God put that on you, and if somebody lays hands on you, they're of the devil. Oh, my goodness. Who would, who would perpetuate that lie? The devil. Why? Because if Satan can get you to believe that God is the one enforcing sickness on you, there's no basis of faith for you to get rid of it. Because if you believe God put it on you, for you to pray to get rid of it would be fighting against God. Hence the lie. It's the same, it's the same old, same old game. 
do something and blame the other guy. Hello? Do something and blame the other guy. And then everybody starts running around blaming, you, blaming the person that didn't do it because the other guy said they did do it. We see it in politics all the time. I mean, in our culture of politics right now, it happens all the time. You know? It's so-and-so's fault. Yet you're the one who did it. But you blame them. And the devil, that, and that, listen, it's from the devil. So that, that thing's the spirit of Antichrist. And so, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing what? Good. And healing. But the people he healed were oppressed, not of God, but of the devil. And when you go back and look at his ministry, they brought in to him, you know, those that were sick, and, this, and he healed them all. Then Paul was about to say, I'm sorry about you. Look, I, I know you're in the healing line, but I just checked in with Dad, and man, I'm sorry. Take him out. He, he's got a lesson to learn before we can pray for him. In fact, he may not ever learn his lesson. He, he may just die that way. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You just never know what my father's going to do. I'm sorry. All right, and, and let's pray for the next guy. That didn't happen. See, when you take some of the things we teach in the church, and, and strip away the religious facade around it and then really analyze it, you're like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Hello? That's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And we see that all the time. God put it on to teach them lesson. Yet you can't find anywhere in the Bible with it, in the ministry of Jesus that God did that. And then I always like to ask people, well, did you ever learn the lesson? Well, they died. Once they learned a lesson, they would get to heaven. You know what lesson they're going to learn? If you had asked me in faith, you could have been healed. It's not that It is that simple. I'm sorry. It is that simple. We make it complicated. Theologians make it complicated. We make it difficult. Getting from God is simple. Except ye become as little children. That childlike faith. If God said he'll do it, he'll do it. And we try to make it deep, difficult, really spiritual. Because so much of the time, we're looking for our position of power. Now, Let's look at Mark chapter 2. So who, who was the oppressor? Who was the healer? Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And he entered again into Capernaum, and after some days it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, and so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as the door that he, uh, he preached. Um, let me see something here real quick, real quick. I'm not sure if I'm going to read this version or the uh, or, or another version. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Um, they came from every town around about, and um, the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Y'all know, you know what? Can you also find that real quick? The power of the Lord was present to heal them. Um, I, I, I'm getting into the, a different version of it, and it leaves some things out. And it leaves some things out that are important, okay? Remember, Mark's written to the Gentiles, so it was written without... Huh? Luke 5. Okay. Thank you. There it is. Same story. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching, there were Pharisees and doctors of the law, had their PhDs, uh, sitting by, and they were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. Listen to this phrase. You need to underline. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. 
the power of the Lord was present to heal them. It would not be present if it wasn't God's will to heal them. None of them got healed. Not a one of those in that room at that moment got healed. But the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed, a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought by means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find, by the way, they might bring him in because of the multitude, the house is cram it's cram jam packed full of people, and they could not get in with the guy on the, on the stretcher. But in that room where all them Pharisees and doctors of the law were sitting, the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Hello? And the word them is not italicized. It was referring to them in the room. And so they went up on the housetop and let and through the tiling let him down in the midst before Jesus. Now here's here's the deal. We got a church service, it's jam cram packed, full, the hallways full, they're outside. Somebody comes up and needs to get in, they can't even get in. Because they've heard Jesus is here. And so all of a sudden we hear and sparks start flying all of a sudden all of a sudden the drop, the drop ceiling gets knocked out and here comes the couch right down here in front everybody's like what in the world and the bible says and when jesus saw their faith they would not be denied you see faith that receives from god cannot be denied it didn't go oh well i tried Oh, well, there's too many people there. No, it would not be denied. They dropped down. He said, he saw their faith. He said, I'm going to prove to you guys I'm the son of God. Rise up, walk. <coughs> Is that what he said? No. No, he's going to play with their theology now. He's going to mess with them. Because the Pharisees and the doctors of the law, those astute, educated bunch, have come to hear this. Galilean and try to figure out why so many people are following him around. Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. You can put, they suck two camels in outside from outside. The low pressure in the room just sucked them right in. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to what? Reason. Reason will get you right out of understanding God saying, who is this that speaketh blasphemous? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said, why reason you in your hearts? Which is easier to say? Which is easier to say? Well, okay, okay King Jimmy, whether is easier to say. We would say, which is easier to say? But the King Jimmy's, whether is easier to say. Stop, underline that. He made a point to say, which is easier for me to, for, to do, to say? Thy sins be forgiven thee, or rise up and walk. Now he just threw them a monkey wrench. Wait a second now. What do we do in the church? Well, you can get, you can get saved, but getting people healed, man, that's hard. Jesus didn't think so. His question was, which, which is easier? The implication is, not, this is not, one's not harder than the other. As we said earlier, same sacrifice. Same plan of God. Hello? But, that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say to you, arise, take up your couch, and go into your house. And immediately he rose up before them, took up whereupon he lay, and departed into his own house, glorifying God. And they all were amazed and glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we've seen strange things today, but they didn't get healed. Now think about it. There is so much in that one statement that should help all of us. 
it's just, I, I'm saved. So I just accepted Jesus. Yes. And he said, which is easier? To get forgiven or to get healed? And I'm going to prove to you that they're basically the same. Get up and walk. But he's proven that's his, that he has power to forgive. Get up and walk. Because he purchased your healing and your salvation at the same time on the cross. Hallelujah. It became a covenant right for the New Testament church. And he doesn't think one is harder than the other. We do. And you know why we do? Because for the most of your life until you came to know Jesus, and even after coming to know Jesus, <clears throat> if you have not renewed your mind to the Word of God, not to Ed Saylor's sermons, but to the Word of God, so that faith has arisen in your heart, we are so sense rule about things, our, our taste, our touch, our sight, our smell, our hearing, that we govern whether something is real or not so many times by our senses. So, because salvation is spiritual and it does not affect our senses. When you receive Jesus as Lord, now you may feel bubbly or excited, but you could say you could count that to emotion or whatever, but you don't feel you can't touch the salvation. Because it was a spiritual manifestation in your human spirit healing is dealing flat out with your physical body and you can feel the pain you can see the injury here and so your mind wants to say it's different but Jesus said they're no different he said they're no different it's just as easy to get healed as it is to get saved. My power will do both. And let's face it, getting you born again is greater, has, it was a greater work than your body getting healed. So healing is nothing. We think it's, it's harder. We think it's worse, more difficult. But for him, nothing. Why? The Bible says, it makes a very interesting statement, that the same power that he used when he raised Christ from the dead, you know, talks about, you know, they were born again according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Wow. Where's Bill when I need him? <laughs> Let's put my scripture. Because I got scriptures down in my notes, and I'm like, I need the because I, I do extemporary as preaching. I just, I go, I go where I'm being led. And a lot of times I have scriptures that I know, but I don't know the, I don't have the reference right then. And let's face it, neither did Jesus. What do you mean? He'd say, it's written in the prophets. Huh? Oh, thank you. It's written in the Psalms. It's written in the law. He didn't, give script, he didn't give scripture in verse, did he? So how Roman Jesus, how about that? You said Romans 3.11? Romans 3.11 is good, but it ain't the verse I'm looking for. Romans 8. That's probably where it should be. I'm in Acts 8. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, from the, uh, that raised up Christ from the dead, shall also quicken your mortal bodies by a spirit that dwelleth in you, that's not the verse. I'm looking for the one that says, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And it sounds like in Ephesians or Colossians type scripture. You probably just put it in what you brought in Christ. Okay, we'll get there. 
Y'all didn't use phones and use computers that have big screens like vinyl clippers. Huh? Huh? That doesn't just sound like an Ephesian scripture. All right, Ephesians 1. Verse 17. There you go. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of his, the glory of his inheritance in the same. And what is the, and want you to know this, the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. What? Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. That's the power he wants us to have encounter with. Let me tell you something, folks. The power it took to raise Jesus from the dead is at work in you. I think it can heal your measly little body. It took Jesus out of the, out of the, uh, the, the captivity of Satan under the control of demon spirits as he paid the price for our sin and raised him from the dead. And that power was so strong when he came out of the grave, according to Matthew, that a bunch of Old Testament saints stopped by and picked their bodies up <clears throat> and went into Jerusalem and were seen of many. Is that, is that Matthew 15, 54 or 20, 54, something like that? It's, 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 in the, it's near the end of Matthew. So you will find that. Yeah, after the resurrection. Yeah, 15 is not. You're right. It's got to be later. But when he was raised from the dead, he went into the... Now, y'all find it anyway. It's in there. Old Testament saints got up, picked at the bodies. With, hey, and you, don't you know they messed up a family reunion? Here comes Uncle Charlie. You know, great, great Uncle Charlie been dead for 80 years, and he comes walking in. Oh, by the way, guys, I saw him. And they all gone. They didn't hang with the Haints have showed up. He come walking in, and all of a sudden, I saw Jesus. He's the Messiah. Uh, you, you've been dead for a long time. Huh? 52. I said 54. That's what messed me up. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, the power was so great that raised from the dead. Anybody in the neighborhood got raised up? Hello? And, and wasn't just, it wasn't secret. They got seen by a bunch of folks. That's the power that's at work in you. And you don't think God can heal your body? Hello? The power of God is great. The work of Jesus is amazing. The plan of God is magnificent. Hallelujah. He's your healer. I said, he's your healer. So which is easier to say? Thy sins be forgiven thee. Arise, take up thy bed and walk. It doesn't matter. You can either one. Well, what's the need is really the question. Do you need to be forgiven or do you need to be healed? Because the power to do either one is available. And it's the same power. Glory to God. I said, glory to God. Hallelujah. It, it's, it's the death God don't go. Oh, man, you need to get healed of cancer. Man, that's a tough one. God's not doing that. I said God's not doing that. He sees 
the finished work of Christ. And it doesn't matter which one you show up with. He's got the answer. His power is enough to raise Christ up from the dead. It's enough to drive cancer out of your body and make you every whit whole. It's enough to heal the leper, to make the blind man see, the deaf man hear, the dumb man speak, the crippled man walk. Hallelujah. It's enough to bring healing and deliverance to every area of your life. Because this, that, and I'm going to I'm gonna have to do a teacher sometime on that passage because the different words for power and stuff are different Greek words. And they all carry and convey a different meaning. All building to this crescendo. The power he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Glory to God. I said glory to God. That's not to say hallelujah over. Amen. Now, Quite frankly, according to my notes, I haven't finished. <laughs> you know the notes I didn't use? <laughs> I d actually, I was preaching from my heart, and some of that was in his notes. <laughs> okay? So I was on track. So we'll, we'll pick up next week. Okay? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. So glad y'all could join us tonight. Time for our midweek offering. If you need an offering envelope, they're on the seat back in front of you. If you give them electronically, go ahead and, uh, you know, get into your cash app and so forth and get that there. Um, we have several things coming up. Um, the week of Easter week, we don't know if we're going to have a Wednesday night service. We, we probably will. I've I, I got to find, you know, uh, the girls, Justin Kapp are going to be in France. Shannon and Dennis are going to be in Italy. Me and Janie and Nathan are going to be at the beach. This is our spring break. So we're all, two are going to be out of the country, two, well, four will be out of the country, two, two couples will be out of the country, the rest of us are going to be down at the beach. And um, so um, we'll let you know for sure by then. Okay? Well, you're actually going to take off? Be, yes, I'm going to take off and be gone. I got, I'm, going to pull my, I'm going to pull my camper out. They're going to set it up. And I'm going to go sit under my umbrella, and I'm going to listen to the waves crash. And I'm going to go eat breakfast over at Breakfast by the Sea, have me scrambled eggs and smoked sausage and grits and whole wheat toast, and then go float on the Lazy River. Hello. And then one night we'll go over to Captain Bennett's Seafood, and Janie will eat all the crab legs that she can eat for the next six months. I will eat my land lovers. I'll eat the fried chicken. And then dooley sausage and some mashed potatoes and gravy and then i'll be the runner for the crab legs and i will watch her eat now, it, it, it's actually one of the, the one of the few meals you will ever her, see her eat me under the table that woman will put down some crab leg mm -hmm. and so will shannon and so will nathan I think Jesse does now. Cap, you do it? How about Dennis? Oh, okay, okay. I'm the only one that sits at the table and goes, fried chicken. Now, I do like the andouille sausage. Or andouille. Is that the proper print? Andouille? Andouille. I like that. Yeah. What, Jesse? Did you laughing at me? Are you making fun of me? Yes, he. So, um, we have to find somebody to preach on Wednesday night. But I have to get my brother Bill and see if, he, if he's available. Okay? Um, I'm not going to bring in a guest speaker on a Wednesday night Bible study. But that's out of everybody, the whole team out of town. You know, I trust you guys. But, no. So, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work, okay? But that's where we're all going to be doing that. And uh, and then some people may be going on somewhere because it's Easter week, and they may be doing something. I don't know. I know you, you give the Dallas a chance, you know, uh, the wind blow a different direction. They're going somewhere. Huh? Going to Savannah. Okay. Yeah, going to Savannah. Yep. yep. Janie said, I don't want to go to Charleston. Not during Easter. Because it's crazy. 
the people, number of people down there are crazy. She said, take me to Southport, some little, little small port town that nobody shows up at. Okay, I'll take you there. Cause I can eat, I can eat me some popcorn shrimp. Yeah, hallelujah. Anyway, praise the Lord. Everybody got your, I gave, now y'all have plenty of time to get your offerings ready. Uh, important, May the 1st, everybody said May the 1st? I believe it's May the 1st, didn't it? Is International Rhema Day. We want you to bring a special offering. Brother Hagin used to be funny. He'd say, uh, you know, Thursday's Rhema Day. Everybody know what Rhema Day means, don't you? Yeah, double up. You know, bring your offering and double, whatever you're going to bring, just bring an offering, bring it and double up. Say, what if I won't go and bring anything? Well, just double up and come on anyway. <laughs> Last night was Rhema Night over at, uh, yeah. So we, um, it was also to be with Pastor Miss Lynette. We just we had a good time, and, uh, and it's always good to see them. We're going to camp meeting this summer's 50th anniversary of camp meeting. I was at the 25th. I was at the uh, 8th camp meeting in 1980. Huh? And at the 40th. Y'all were at the 40th. Were we at the 42? Okay. I mean, I've been more than just those, but, you know, I was at the 25th. I was at the, we'll be at the 50th. My first camp meeting was 1980. And um, being a good Pentecostal holiness boy and seeing what I saw had to make, had to make some changes in my life. Because I saw the, way, the move of the Spirit in a way that I'd never seen it growing up. Because growing up you had to be, you had to get the, the Holy Ghost shakes and you had to bop your head all over the place and the hair, the beehive had to come down for God to be moving. I'm just telling you how it was. In the building with no air conditioning, with the bug lights, the yellow bug lights. And that's where Laverne Trip used to go. The Piney Grove Camp Meeting down in Chocowinity, North Carolina. That's where, that's where he cut his teeth as a young Pentecostal holiness boy at the Piney Grove. You ask Laverne Trip about Piney Grove, he'll, he'll, he got, he'll tell you all about Piney Grove. Hello? So, anyway, um, my first camp meeting. Brother Roberts preached the sermon. You may have seen the book, Blood Tide Blessings. He, that's the first time he preached it. And that was good. Yeah, my first camp meeting, I got to see Oral Roberts. My commencement speaker from Raymond was Oral Roberts. I think that's just cool. Amen? So anyway, um, God's good, and I'm just rambling. So can we take up the offering? Lord, we bless the people as they give. We bless as they tithe. We bless all of our givers in Jesus' name according to your word. Amen. And I want to thank all of y'all for joining us tonight. We appreciate you tuning in and being a part. Share the service with people. We want to reach as many people as we can. If you live in the uh, greater uh, Greensboro area, the Piedmont Triad of North Carolina, we invite you to join us over in Pleasant Garden. Now, look, it's, you know, Pleasant Gardens, it is not way out there. It is 4.3 miles from the Elm Eugene Interstate 85 exit. That is not a long way out there. So come over, <coughs> join us. If you live out in the uh, further southeast part of the county, you can come in and come up Hunt Road. We're three miles off of uh, NC 62 and come right up into our church. Praise God, we're right, we're in a really good location. And we'd love to have you join us at 6302 Walter Wright Road in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina. Like we said, part of the Greater Greensboro Piedmont Triad Metroplex. We'd love to have you join us, praise God. So we meet again. Remember these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. See you next time here live and in person at Expedition Church of the Triad. Love you. Good night. God bless you. See you next time. Hallelujah. All righty. <laughs>